Thank you so much, Joe. So the moment I came to know that I'm talking after Shai Resnick, I thought, let's not talk about Angular, right? Because Angular doesn't make more sense after his talk. <laughs> so let's talk about functional reactive JavaScript. OK, uh, just a heads up, this is a 20-hour talk, cut down to 20 minutes. And it all started one day at work when I was talking to a friend of mine, and he came up with this simple little question. What the heck is this buzzword functional reactive programming? I felt blank, because I couldn't give him a good answer. Have you ever been in a situation where you have to explain functional reactive programming to a mere civilian? <laughs> I don't know what you told them, but this is what I told them. So it's a way to get your talks accepted at conferences. That's why I'm here. And it's the most recent way JavaScript developers have invented to impress their peers. <laughs> Hello. As he said, my name is Anas Firdasi, and I'm originally from a country in this background called Pakistan. I'm a senior software architect at PayPal. I also run the NG Pakistan community, and we are glad we're having a NG Conf extended there. So hello to everybody there. And I've been doing JavaScript for about 12 years now, and doing some Angular production apps these days for a few months. Uh, but that's not important here. What's important is functional programming. Let's cut this wiki definition down to a few points we can remember. So program like you're doing maths. Avoid mutating things that are out of your scope. And you've got to be declarative. That is to say, you've got to write more expressive code. So in the functional part, I've got five things that I would like to talk to you about today, starting with separation. But just before that, here's the ng-con blog we'll be creating today. So we have a list of posts, each with a teaser text. We have the name of the user logged in. Any resemblance to our Jeff Cross is accidental. And we have the admin report button which actually tells how the, report, how, the, how the blog is doing. So when I click on this execute report button, this function gets executed. So this function accepts a URL as an input and then executes the report. I want you to focus only on this part of the function. You'd like to separate functions from things it is acting upon, like random ghost inputs. Because if I look at the signature of the function, I don't see that it depends on window.location or date. How do you test this function and port them to an environment other than a browser? So you always have to mock such ghost inputs. So what you do is you set the inputs outside the function, depending upon the environment you're running in, and then pass them along to your functions. Now your function signature explicitly explains what it, ne what it needs to do what it does. So that's the first type of separation. We separate functions from environments. Now remember the teaser text that we had? These teaser texts can help us understand the second type of separation, that is between mutations and calculations. So how do we generate these teasers? So here's the teaser function. Now let's try to separate mutations from calculations, or at least try to isolate mutations, because those are the trickier parts to reason about, because the order in which you do things matter. So here I'm grabbing all the paragraphs within the block class and passing them to the teaser function one by one by using the map function. So the idea is to first do all types of calculations, and uh, calculations which are pure because you're not changing anything. And then you do mutations like you're using this set tech functions to do the mutations. The problem here is our teaser function is doing both calculations as well as mutations. I want you to think of creating independent calculation pipelines. Again, read it from right to the left. So now here, you, you call the get text function, which is ignorant of the input, and then you teaser the text down to 60 characters, which is a very naive implementation of how you generate teasers. And then you set the text to environment. So you're ignorant of your input environment, and you're ignorant of your output environment. Now, uh, let's take our pipeline to our previous algorithm. So the only thing our teaser function do is slice the text given to it by set text function. So we actually isolated mutation to the set text function and took it out of the teaser function. This is just a taste of separating mutations from calculations. And we'll be, uh, we'll be diving deep into more kinds of separation along the way. And so let's jump right into pure functions. 
We all have been uh, writing three kinds of functions. So the first are mapping functions. So you pass in x, it converts it to y, and, and just returns the result. And then there are other types of functions like procedure functions and IO functions in which you have steps like do this and then do this, and then you produce a lot of side effects. So we'll be concentrating only on mapping functions while talking about purity. Just to keep it kind of methy, a function is a single-valued collection of pairs. So if you pass in one to this function, it will produce three. And no matter how many times you pass one to this function, it's always going to produce three. And passing two to this function produces five. Now, passing two, for example, can never produce eight. That's just not possible. So what you can pass to a function is its domain, and what you get out of a function is its range. For example, a scoring function. You can never get a negative value out of a scoring function. That's just not in the range of the scoring function. So what makes a function pair? Well, let's, look at the, uh, well, let's look at this real quick. So given the same input, it's always going to return the same output. It has no side effects, which actually means that it avoids mutating shared state or even working with shared state altogether. And it solely depends on the arguments passed to it. That is to say, it never relies on external state. Now let's play the pure impure game. So here's a scoring function, which totally depends on, OK, the arrows are a bit off. OK. So it totally depends on the input passed to it. So this is a pure function. And then we have our own slice function, which actually gives you a subset of an array, but it never mutates the actual array. So that's a pure function there. But then we have a splice, which actually mutates the actual array and gives you a subset. That's an impure function. And then we have pop, which is again impure because it mutates the actual array. Now maybe we can write impure functions in a pure way. So this is like maybe a pure version of uh, pop. And there can be other ways in which you can pop an element without mutating the actual element. So now we want to add some sort functionality where I can sort by latest, famous, and shortest post. Now the whole UI is the whole UI layer is most predictable when it is defined as a pure function of the application state. Now what is an application state? It's a collection of objects, and a simplified version of it may look like this, where you have a sort flag and then an array of objects, each representing a post. Now here is the on state change pure function. We pass two, thing, uh, two things to it. So A, the current application state, and then the action we are trying to do, that is sort here. Since this function is pure, it does not mutate the current state, rather creates new state. Few folks call these functions as reducers. So essentially, what you're doing over time is you're actually creating a history of application states, which brings us to time traveling in purity. This history objects brings us to time traveling. So suppose you go from state 1 to 2 to 3 to 4. And then you can always come jump from state 4 to 2 or 3 to 1 if you have preserved all the states. So, so you're, you're not actually regenerating the states, but actually jumping back to a state which is already there. Now, I, I leave this slide with this question. I have this a crazy idea and talk to Patrick about this. How about if we can create more than was because in, in Angular Universal, what you do is you actually uh, create, like, render your initial state on the server. How about creating more than one initial stages, which you can implement through a service worker, and then time travel into the future? When I say time traveling in the future, what I'm saying is I won't be generating the state on the fly, because I'll, I'll, I'll already have the state being generated, and then I'll just jump, back, uh, jump from state one to state three, or any, on, anywhere in the future. So that's just a crazy idea. So purity, it's reliable because it's predictable. It's testable because it does not have ghost inputs, as we, as we discussed. It's portable because it's independent of the application state. It's independent of the environment, I'm sorry. It's, port, it's memoizable because it, it, it can help us create history and memoize them. And then it's parallelizable because that's a tongue twister. Parallel. It's parallelizable because it does not affect shared state. So things can go in parallel. Now let's talk about function allowance real quick. So generally we think of functions as verbs, but in the light of functional programming, function can be thought of as nouns. So ultimately functions are defined by rules, but if we step back 
and not think of functions as rules defined inside of them and all the things the function do, but think of functions as something that passes things through and converts it from one thing to another. For example, here we have an array of colorful circles. We pass them to a map function, which maps them to a triangle. Then we pass it to a take function and take the first three elements. Then we concat two more elements, and then we pass it to a filter function to filter only the red ones. Did you get the feel? Functions are just passing values through. Now let's jump right into querying and composition. So we said in mathematics, function take one input and produces one output. But that's a pain, like I have functions, and you all have written functions which take more than one input. So we converted this mathematical phenomena of one input, one output, to one input at a time produces one output. Like we want to be lazy, and we give inputs to functions one by one. Uh, let's look at a simple function that adds two numbers. We all have created adder functions out of this function by being lazy and passing only one input at a time. And when you do that, you get another function as a result, and JavaScript somehow remembers the environment that is, in this case, the value of x that was passed to the original function. I'm not going to use the word closure because that's another topic. And then you call the adder with value to get the value plus 10 every time. What if I want to pass in, like, what if I want to add, like, four numbers? Now, that's a very bad implementation, and there are a lot of unwanted closures there. So what you do is you use a currying function. So welcome to currying. So this is the function to help us curry our functions. Now, don't, now I don't expect you to get hold of this function if you haven't seen it before. So it's returning a function which says I'm a new function. If I were given fewer arguments than the original function wanted, I just, I'll just remember what was passed to me and will wait for the actual arguments. But if somebody passes in all the arguments which the original function wanted, then just pass it along to the original, original function. In general, you don't have to implement this because it's implemented by 100 different libraries in 1,000 different ways. So you don't have to do that. So all what you do is use that querying function and make your function implementations flatter. <clears throat> And then, you gotta be, and then you can be lazy about passing arguments. So that was currying in less than two minutes, by the way. Uh, let's talk about composition. So most of us have done these basic composition, like creating an nth function and then compose a specific functions, like a second function out of an nth function. Now let's go back to our interface. Do you remember the greetings and username we display? How do we do that? So here's the basic function we started from. Uh, but we wanted to append Mr. or Mrs. based on gender, so we changed our function a little and make it l look like this. But then we wanted to add more stuff to this function and we cannot just keep on adding stuff to our function. So we create separate composable functions for each part of our greetings. And how do we compose a message for Jeff? So we pass Jeff to beard, and then we pass the result to mail, and then we pass the result to casual readings, which actually generates sub Jeff. Now let's talk about functors and monads. Okay, and this is the time in functional programming when people started unfriending you because these are like some <laughs> religious topics. So I'll try to like, you know, blast all the slides right in there. So functor is an object that you can map over. But we are, no, we are, we are so hardwired to think of map as something which can help us iterate over an array, which is not true. You should be able to map over any type of object. So here is a box object or a function, whatever you want to call it, which has a property value. And then you, call it a f and then you create a box functor, which actually returns a new instance of the box uh, type. Now, whenever I call the box functor and give it a value, it's just going to give me something like this. But what if I want to pass box functor and pass it ngconf and then pass the whole thing to some function which is to lowercase or to uppercase and, on, and that kind of a function? You cannot use our box functor on top of these functions because it's just going to return an object as we just saw. So what we can do is we can add a map function in our box type, which actually whatever function you pass to this, uh, 
map implementation, it's going to just run this function on the value property. So now we can just do it like this and call our map function. <coughs> I'm just going to go, okay, so here's another slide on this. So we can map over a map. So you have a box functor, you pass in an array, and then you call the reverse function, and then you call the last function, and then you get the result. And similar is another example. We'll skip over this real quick, and uh, let's look at this, some, some real world examples. So we grab the query selector and put it in get DOM elements. So what we're trying to do is we are trying to get value of all the classes with uh, all the blog ratings classes in our HTML. Now there's a problem. What if you don't find the blog rating class on your HTML? Your get DOM element is going to return a null. And then you're calling get value on top of that. So when you do that, you're going to mess up. So what you do is you create a maybe functor. And that's just an idea to avoid nulls and stuff in your code so that you don't have to worry that if, it is, if something returns null, what's going to happen, and will I be able to call another function on top of that? So you call maybe functors. And I'm not going to go into how we implement maybe functors because of lack of time. Then we have monads and monads, another religious debate. So anything that implements concat and empty is a monad, and anything that implements mjoin and chain is monads. We're going to just look at just one example. So mjoin is to custom types, but flatten is to arrays. And I hope you all have used flatten. So we have used flatten to flatten maybe like a couple of bunch of arrays and then we flatten it down to a single array, right? But we can use that on any type other than arrays as well. So what I'm doing here is I'm calling, uh, I'm getting the type ID, and I'm again using the maybe functor, trying to compose these two together to get the type ID. Similar, I get the author ID, right? So what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to get all posts from an author of a particular type. But then the problem is going to happen is author ID is going to return maybe, maybe. And then type ID again is going to return maybe. And then we compose to you get a maybe, maybe, and the result. How do you solve this problem? Now I have to flatten it down, right? As I said, it's, it's exactly the same as flatten, but for custom types. So what I do is I use this mjoin thing, which actually flattens this stuff down, and then you can go ahead with your results and then do chaining on top of this. So if anybody wants to talk about monads further, I'm here. I'll be talking about this after the talk. Now let's talk about reactive programming. There are a couple of awesome frameworks like uh, BaconJS and RxJS and CycleJS. And then there are platforms like Angular, which can help you go as much reactive as you want. So why is everyone so interested about reactive programming? What on earth is reactive programming anyways? It's programming with async data streams. It's a programming paradigm oriented around data flows, making the propagation of change smooth and easier to reason about. So I think reactive programming is easier than most of the programming styles we do every day, but there's only one barrier. That is thinking in terms of reactive programming. Since you don't have time to code, and I'm not super awesome at live coding, we'll, we'll dive deep in to see how we think in terms of reactive programming. So I want to talk about three things here to help us think in terms of RP. Reactive programming is based heavily on two design patterns, the observer and the iterator pattern. Now before we go into this, so observables are like scrums. Everybody have their own definition of it, and everybody thinks that everybody else is wrong. <laughs> so, so in the observer pattern, you have two constructs, an observable and an observer. To start with, an observer makes a request to the observable that, hey, send me some data whenever you have something. Now, the observable maintains a list or somehow keeps track of all the observables, and then there can be multiple observables. So an observable can emit values to its subscribers, and it can be observed or subscribed to, and subsequently unsubscribed from over time. Then we have an observer which can listen to an observable and receive data from observable and then generally apply some data manipulation pipelines on the received response. Now let's talk about this heated religious debate of push versus pull architecture. So pull nature is common. We as consumers of data 
explicitly ask for a value from the data producer at some point in time, like reading an array. That's pulling, requesting value from the data source. Pull is not continuous. You pull the value w once, and then whenever you want to do it, you have to do it again. It's like you don't have a connection between a data source and a data consumer. So it kind of sounds like the consumer is in charge of the data here. In contrast to this, in a push architecture, the observer defines an interface. And when you're subscribing to an observable, you're actually telling the observable, look, if you have some good data, do this. If you have some bad data, do that. So the observer defined these interfaces or callbacks and inform the observable about it. That's what happens when you actually subscribe to observable. Whenever we have an update, the observable actually pushes the data to all its observers. And, and, that, what happen, and that happens continuously over time. Now push is different. Push is continuous. The values are pushed until the consumer asks the data producer to remove its subscription. And now the subscription is another story, like how we actually unsubscribe from an observable. And I'm not going to be talking about this right now. So in a push architecture, the data producer is more in charge of the data than the data consumer. Now a few days back, I was Skyping a friend of mine. And he asked me, since everything is a stream, what is not a stream? I said, look, since everything is a stream, let me make it more difficult for you. Nothing is not a stream. <laughs> so a timer, like set interval in JavaScript, that can happen over time and continuously generate some data can be observed. Mouse clicks, drags, drops, hovers, and keystrokes as user inputs can happen over time. And that's an observable there. And then any async calls to networks which bring one piece of data or multiple pieces of information over time. That's an observable there. Shared services across your components, doing some IO operations, or maintaining your states, that can be turned into an observable. Form inputs like a text box change, or a check change, or a drop down selection, that can be treated as observables as well. And then new ways of user inputs like speech and gesture and whatnot. All of that can be observed over time. And then we have classical data structures, which we'll skip over, and then anything. That's a dot, dot, dot for anything. OK, so now the iterator pattern, real quick. It has three pieces to it. And a lot of folks overlook the first piece, which talks about traversal of different data types of collections. So what it says is, I don't care if you are, if you are producing data by moving the mouse over a screen or you're downloading a file. If it's data, it's data. It's collection. I call it polymorphic traversal because it treats all types of collections the same way. Now, a trader pattern, like observer pattern, gives data to the consumer one item at a time. And while it's trading over a list, it only cares about two things. Does the collection have more data that we're interested in? If it has more data, how can we get to the next data pointer? So data producer progressively sends data to the consumer one item at a time. And with it, sends an indicator if the stream has completed or not. Now, I would like you to focus on this done true because that's the magic. That was the missing piece in how Gang of Four described this pattern like 20 years back. And we finally realized it. Because previously, a lot of subscriptions were always alive and were never disposed because you never had this indicator from the data producer that, hey boy, no more data. And ES6 has a lot of support for iterators. I blog about it quite a lot, so you can go and check my blogs. I'll share the links in the end. Now, to finish off this, I want to talk about the streams and reactions over time together, because all of what you do is wait for streams and react when something happens. Now, this is the main ng-con talk interface, and only the best talks will make to this interface. Looks like the talk started coming. So serious talk from Shai Resnick. Keep waiting for that. Rx from Ben Lish and NG Beard is my favorite talk from Jeff Cross. NG1 is alive. So we have a couple of talks. So do you see the, that gray area where you have to drop your talks? So all what you need to do is to click on your favorite talk and drag it to that area. The number of talks selected counter is incremented as soon as you do that. And the progress bar shows up when you click on the download button. So to start with, we have a number of talks appearing over time. We click on any of the talk and start dragging it. Then drop the talk. 
to be downloaded, the, the drop triggers the counter and that gets incremented. And as we click on the download button, progress bar for each file being downloaded shows up. Uh, let's bring this down to a single scale in time. Does it look like a scatter plot? Now, uh, let's merge them down over the scale of time. You see, that's what the user is doing on the page. That's the reactive mindset you gotta have. And then you have several different ways to merge these streams depending upon the reactive framework that you're using. I'm not gonna be talking about that. So let's close our discussion with a bigger picture. A bigger picture. So that's all what it is. You have async event streams and you're able to create streams out of anything. Then you literally feed these streams to powerful set of rules, utilities, functions, mappers, filters, and much more from the functional world to create what I call reactive user interfaces. Now I wish somebody didn't call their interface React. <laughs> That's not reactive. <laughs> now in Angular 2, we have a lot of things that we can observe and be reactive about. I promise that's my last slide. You can, you can listen uh, to routes. You can listen to HTTP calls, which is heavily based on RxJS. And then form fields are based off of event emitters and observable wrappers, so you can observe them too. Then interactive user interfaces can easily be observed. And then you can create observable type variables in your services and elsewhere to be observed and react upon. And then we are observing the promising GitHub issue 406, 4062, and Rob Wolverd will hate me for this, which indicates that we'll be providing a way to delegate arbitrary DOM events to a subject observable, so that it could be easily subscribed to be handled reactively. So it's like more observables are coming to Angular too. And that's why I said we can be as reactive as you want while using Angular. So in conclusion, FRP is a programming paradigm for reactive programming using the building blocks of functional programming. There are a couple of resources I'll share. So start catching all the streams out there. But there's a lot of stuff to learn. So learn and work towards it over time. Take it easy. Thank you very much. <laughs>